Well, good morning to you. This is Morning Mail for Thursday, November the 4th, 2021. Good to be with you this morning. Very, very chilly day here in Hereford, Texas. Got down the low I heard last night was 28 degrees and a little bit of wind, so it's uh, plenty chilly outside. Although, it's supposed to be back up to 80 for a high by Saturday. You know, that's the way it is in November. Anyway, certainly good to be with you today. I hope that you are having a good day. We're going to look at one verse from Philippians chapter 4 this morning, a very popular, in fact, you could probably say the most well-known verse of the whole book. So we'll talk about Philippians 4.13 in just a moment. But before we do that, let's begin with prayer. Loving Father, we're grateful for the day that you've blessed us with, even though it's cold. Uh, we know it's just a, another sign of your presence and your activity in our world, the changing of the seasons and Winter time is coming upon us, and we just pray, Father, that you continue to watch over and be with us as we go about our activities, as time continues to move along, because we know, Father, that one day time will end, and your Son will return uh, to gather the redeemed, that the dead in Christ would ri will rise, and those of us who are living will meet the Lord in the air. And as Paul said, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Father, thank you for the opportunity this weekday morning, this Thursday morning, as well as every weekday morning that we have to come together and, and reflect upon a, a few verses from your word. May it benefit us and may you be glorified. Be with our family, our loved ones, be with those in need of our prayers, particularly those who uh, are dealing with severe illnesses and also particularly, Father, those uh, who are dealing with uh, the death of a loved one. We pray, Father, that you'd help us to be your hands and heart and voice as we seek to comfort and, and to cons be with them. We pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, most people have heard of the idea of the power of positive thinking. Perhaps you have even subscribed to the idea and determined to have a more positive outlook in the future. More than likely, if you have accepted this concept, you have heard the words of Philippians chapter 4, verse 13, quoted as Bible authority for such teaching. That verse says, quote, I can do all things through him who strengthens me, end of quote. That's the verse we're going to look at today. These words are definitely the most well-known of the whole book. However, they have little or nothing to do with positive thinking. These words rise from Paul's declaration two verses earlier in verse 11 of Philippians 4, where he said, quote, I have learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am, end of quote. As if to make certain no one thought of such learning as, as being from personal power alone, Paul added these famous words of verse 13, attributing the power for every accomplishment to Christ. Instead of verse 13 being a text for positive thinking, it is a text about God's watching over and empowering us on a daily basis to deal with our problems. 
the power that the Lord gives us is much deeper than our thinking. He wants to change our actions as well as our thoughts. One may think regularly, deeply, powerfully, yet never accomplish anything. We've all met professors who seem to know what was right or wrong with everyone else, with what everyone else wrote or did. And yet they never wrote a single book themselves. They never moved beyond the role of critiquing the work of others to do anything for themselves. In our Christianity, it is easy to make commitments, to plan big, and to think of brilliant works that we hope to accomplish. Most such plans remain on paper and never grow the legs and arms to make them work. On occasion, I've had uh, opportunity to visit with various congregational leaders. And occasionally I've asked about their plans for growth. Something like, what kind of congregation do you want to be? Well, when that's asked, one of two answers usually results. Some look at one another with a puzzled expression as though such a thought had never occurred to them. Planning for the future seems to be unscriptural to them. Others pull out elaborate plans of what they are going to do and where they are going to be in the next 20-30 years. And then I ask, how long have you had this plan? And the answer is usually, well, several years now. And so I ask, how far down the road are you toward meeting these goals? And they may say, well, not very far. As a matter of fact, we have further to go now than when we made the plan. Plans are important, but God does not give power just to planning and then doing nothing. When Paul wrote to the Corinthians about their promise to assist the poor saints in Jerusalem, he commended them for the promise and challenged them to do what they had promised. Too often our faith remains heady, that is, in the head. If it doesn't change our actions and make better people of us, it is not at all the faith described in the Bible. Do you ever have endeavors which you think are somehow beyond the scope of God's blessings and help? Well, Paul's statement here in Philippians 4.13 should help. God's power was not just available to help him learn contentment. He was able by his power to do all things. Nothing right, moral, or good is beyond the scope of God's power. Of course, he does not give us power for evil, but if it is right to do, God gives us power to do it. Think of the marvelous implications of that statement. It means 
God will help us with problems on our jobs. If the work is honest in nature and something we have the right to do to begin with, God will bless those efforts. Paul was aided by God when he made tents, the same as he was when he preached the gospel through the support of others. If he had made shoddy tents, his message for Christ would have been equally ineffective. <clears throat> God also gives us power to be what he wants us to be in the family. I've heard many say, I just do not love him or her anymore, and I do not believe I ever can. On their own, that may well be the truth. But as Christians, they are not on their own. The God who made marriage and joined them together in that marriage can give them power to fall deeply in love with a mate again if they are willing to submit to him. You know, I am thankful that the text did not say, I can do all religious things through him who th strengthens me. Now, religious things is obviously involved in all things, but it is not limited to that. God has never sought to pull our lives apart. We are not one part secular, another part physical, another part intellectual, and another part spiritual. Christianity, as God planned it, moves with equal ease and power in every area of our lives, changing them all. God does not call upon us to do anything in any area without giving us the power to carry it out. You know, Ephesians 1 and verse 3 says that God blesses us with, quote, every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, end of quote. Jesus said in John 14 and verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. And John writes in 2 John verse 9, that not to abide in the teachings of Christ is to go on without God. God has offered to us the greatness of his power with the stipulation that we can only have it through Jesus Christ, his Son. To take our text, John, Philippians 4.13, offering tremendous power and blessings to people and apply it to one who does not believe in Jesus as the Son of God is to miss the point. To apply it to one who rejects the authority of Christ is to pull it completely from out of what uh, is, is being said. To use it as a positive thinking pep talk for those who live constantly in rebellion to God and the Lord's commands is to offer false hope and false help. To claim the power, we must know Jesus. We must live in relationship with him on a daily basis so that he is the heart and core of of our lives, Philippians 1.21. We must strive always to take on his mind and his attitude, Philippians 2 verse 5. And we must press forward toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus, Philippians 3.14. Then, out of such a close, 
personal relationship with the Lord, we can find the power to do what he calls us to do. You see, God strengthens men. God's amazing power is obvious everywhere. Think of the power of a volcano or the power of an earthquake. God's power is there. Think of the power required to bring the sunshine and the rain, the freezing temperatures that we experienced here last night. Think of the power shown in the miracle of Christ's birth by a virgin, of the mighty miracles of Christ's healing, and the great miracle of his resurrection from the dead. God's power is there. Think of the power that will be shown when Jesus bursts through the heavens with a shout and ends the ticking of earth's clock to bring the redeemed into glory and the ungodly into punishment. God's power is there. But far beyond all of that, God's power is in our lives. He strengthens us as he gave David power to slay the giant, he gives us the strength to slay the giants of sin which haunt us daily. As he gave Paul the power and strength to handle unjust imprisonment and the horrible treatment he underwent at the hands of ungodly men, he strengthens us. Paul illustrated his strengthening well when he wrote in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Turn with me, if you will, there to that passage. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I want to read with you verses 15 through 18. 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning in verse 15. Be on guard against him yourself, for he vigorously opposed our teaching. Now that's talking about uh, Alexander the coppersmith from the previous verse. Then he says in verse 16, At my first defense, no one supported me, but all deserted me. May it not be counted against them. But, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, so that through me the proclamation might be fully accomplished, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was rescued out of the mouth of the lion. The Lord will rescue me from every evil deed, and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Today, for us, the power is available to accomplish whatever God wants us to do. But it must be claimed through Christ who gives the strength. As we close out this week's morning mail tomorrow, we're going to consider verses 14 to 20 of Philippians chapter 4. On Monday, then, we will finish out our look at the letter of Philippians. For today, though, let's close our time in prayer. Gracious Father, indeed, what a, what a tremendous promise you have made to us that through Christ and through the strength that comes from our following and doing His will, that you enable us to do anything that's good and right and in accordance to your will. What a promise. What a power. What a blessing. 
May we, Father, not only reflect and <clears throat> read about and think about that, but may we put it into our lives, knowing that as we seek to accomplish your will and the spreading of your gospel, to letting others know about Jesus and his sacrifice, that indeed we can do it, that you enable us to carry out the thing you want us to do. Father, I continue to lift up those who are dealing with loss of loved one. In particular, Father, right now I'm mindful of the Barron's family and the passing of Kay. And we just pray, Father, that you, you would be with them and help us to minister them unto them at this time. Be with our world and our country. Be with us individually. Be with our congregations, wherever we may be, that we might serve and do your will as we study and reflect upon your word and put it into practice in our lives. We thank you for the Christ. And we pray in his wonderful name. Amen. Go make your Thursday a wonderful one. It's going to warm up today here at least, and we'll see you tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock.